them the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. On behalf of the family, I would like to thank you for being here this morning. I am honored today, and it is a sincere privilege of mine to be able to serve this family as we remember such a fine, wonderful, loving, caring, godly Christian man and Brother Bob Warren. I know, friends and family, that today uh, it, hurt, it hurts. Uh, there is grief, there is mourning, and yet deep down there is part of us that is extremely joy-filled for Brother Bob. We do not know the hour in which the Lord will beckon us home, and the Lord is uh, certain that He tells us this in His Word. And so, friends, today the Lord has been faithful to His Word. I want to encourage you this morning to turn your hearts to the Lord Jesus and to His Word and to find comfort for your souls. I pray that deep down in the depths of your heart, the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will begin to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 28, My soul weeps because of grief, strengthen me according to your word. It seems that the psalmist knew that there is strength that is unlike any other in the word of God. And here is the comfort. The Bible says, for we know that if this earthly tent which is our house is torn down, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for indeed in this house we groan longing to be clothed in our dwelling from heaven. And I know Brother Bob longed for that. Inasmuch as we have Putting it on will not be found naked, for indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave, God who gave, us, uh, gave to us the Spirit as a pledge, therefore being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are absent, knowing home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. The Christian preference, and I'm sure Brother Bob's preference as well, was to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. And today, Brother Bob's at home. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for today. And Father, I thank You for the life that we get to celebrate today. It's not a service really of mourning it's a service of celebration today as we remember a fine godly man an evangelist a pastor brother bob warren i ask you lord to bless and comfort this family and i ask god that this service would serve in such a way as to bring healing to the lives and hearts of this family and these friends father we love you we thank you for your spirit here lord the spirit that you give us that gives us peace and comforts us Thank you, Father, that you're near the brokenhearted. And we thank you, Lord, for today. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have to tell you what a humbling experience this is to be able to stand here and speak <clears throat> to a friend and a great man of, of God <clears throat> that has been such an example to all of us. But I, I was trying to prepare some thoughts about a eulogy. I couldn't help this. The first thing that came to my mind was this. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice 
and be glad in it. How many have ever been in a service with Brother Bob Warren when he started the service with a scripture passage <clears throat> much like this? I mean, you were encouraged from the get-go. And if we hadn't started this one this way, I think he would have had a word to say to us is when we see him again. I'm very mindful of that fact, too, about respecting him and honoring him, but also remembering that the one that we really honor here today is the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to be lifted up. Bob would lift him up. And we just want to honor a man who was faithful to that call. Not all services could begin with a eulogy with declaring that we should rejoice and be glad in this day. Not all services could be this way, but this one has a very unique part to it. And this, this service is not just about a celebration or about the loss of a life, someone that we don't know where he is. But this is a message and this is a, a eulogy and a time of celebration about a legacy of a man who lived life fully and faithfully right up to quitting time. And I mean, he did it faithfully and he set an example for all of us. However, I, I really would not be accurate to insinuate that this is not a very hurtful and painful time. It is. It's a time of separation for a while. It's a time of struggling and in the future when all settles down, it'll, there'll be a vacant chair and there'll be a, a voice that's missing. And in church services, and Brother Kyle and I were just talking about that, the amen corner, someone's gonna have to take that up because he was, he was the amen corner. And he, he just was, when he wasn't preaching, he was, he was encouraging the pastor or the preacher that was delivering the message. And I think it was because he wanted to be preaching, that's the only way he could say something. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it was. He had to say something, but uh, it was always, he was always a wonderful support. He, he just was such a strong encourager. He was a wonderful soldier of the cross. And I just heard this week, I was reminded of this, that soldiers of the cross never die. They live on. And Brother Bob is alive and well today, and we can celebrate. And though there will be times of memory and hurt and pain and separation, for a while, there's also that blessed hope that Bob so loved to talk about and um, did so well in reminding us that the Lord is going to return. And we have a hope fixed beyond this life. And he testifies of that so much. To the family, Carolyn, um, you and Bob spent 17 years together. And what a team you were. What a team you are and the legacy that you've left behind. When God brought you together, he used your talents, he used your gifts, he blended them together to make a difference in the lives of churches, Emmanuel Baptist Church, churches in the area, wherever you went and ministered, and that lives on. I know you're, you'll miss him. We all will, but not like you will, but the memories are precious. Richard and Julie, what can I say? And Dennis and Terry and... Brother Tim and Deborah, he's left a legacy and grandkids and great grandkids. You have someone to really look to as a great example of how to live the Christian life. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that. And I think Bob was ready. He was ready for his home going and he, he knew that he was experiencing a time and his body was getting older and he was getting tireder. And the, what he called his earth suit was, had some holes in it. It was kind of wearing out. And his tent was kind of sagging a little bit. And he was getting tired of having to avoid pine cones and eating pie at any time he wanted to. And in fact, when the pill stopped working, he'd say, I, I said, Bob, you shouldn't eat that pie. He said, well, I'll just take a pill. He said, you, I, I don't think it works that way. But, but, but he was good with that. And, and he did. Uh, he loved life and he loved it fully but he had that kind of spirit about him. Eulogies are, um, are something that speaks of good words about the one that has departed. And they're to be accurate and they are to be not just sentimental, but they need to be truthful and respectful, but truthful. And Bob would be, <clears throat> be the first one to say that he's not a perfect man by any means. He would say to us, he said, I'm a sinner saved by grace Saved as a nine-year-old boy by a shock of votes. Is that correct? Somewhere near Windsor, Missouri. 
And little did he know uh, at that time that he was being, going to be called into ministry and you're going to have and you have before you in your program his obituary and it talks about all the things that God did in this man's life. All of us here today have been touched by Brother Bob in some way. And we have a, a, great, a great man before us to remember. And in writing this obituary, um, he, would, he would tell us that you're, he said one day, when you think about life, he said, you know, we're all writing our own funeral service by the way we live. Anyone heard that before? Some of you meant, uh, that he's mentored? He says, we, will, we are, what, <clears throat> what we are known for tells the story of who we are, and by their fruit you shall know them. He says, we are, we're going to be known for our calling, our work, and our accomplishments. We are known by our family and friends. We are known by our failures and struggles and how we handled them. We are known by our expressions of faith, and someday that will be known. And when we're, we're thinking about a eulogy and and since Brother Bob's gone on, we're thinking about these good words. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to remember how Bob impacted your life. Because you know where his eulogy really sits today, or really is today? It's in these pews. We are all have something that we can contribute to this, this man and how he affected our life. And I would call your attention to your program, the little, not the program, the guide, the obituary order of service and I want you to spend some time uh, some time perhaps today just looking at this because it will give you a list of, of things that brother Bob has been involved with through the years and we've been privileged and our memories have been touched by watching these beautiful films and clips the heaven airs quartet and the singing and these pictures of life and family what a great memory but I want us just to, to look at this for a moment because it, it gives Brother Bob Warren, age 79, Webb City, Missouri, went home to be with the Lord at 7.30 a.m. He was born in June, on June 16, 1933 in Windsor, Missouri. Returned to Webb City in 1994 from Arizona. And Brother Bob has been an encouragement. He has, he has shared his love for the Lord through pastoring friends, funerals, weddings, and baptisms. He goes on to say that after he retired from full-time ministry that Bob graduated from Windsor High School where he was president of his class, 1951. And then he answered the call to, to full-time ministry. And Bob took his high school degree and he's one of the most educated men would probably ever meet. And if you'd see the schools that he attended from Southwest Baptist College to Baylor University to Texan, Texas Christian University, University of Kansas, Midwestern Bible theological seminary it just tells me that Bob was a lifelong learner and he loved books and he loved to read and he loved to expand the knowledge and apply it to God's Word his pastoring ministry we can look that over and recognize those churches some of your thoughts would go back to a specific church in time where Bob pastored perhaps it was in Carterville where he pastored twice early on 1921 year old young man and all down through those pastorates that he served in, from Texas to Missouri to Arizona. And then while in Arizona, Bob served on the Southern Baptist Convention in several capacities, Director of Evangelism, Missions Division, Baptist Student Union Director, led in the building of the BSU centers all over Arizona college campuses, Director of Training Union, Music and Brotherhood, he was instrumental in starting the Genesis Area Metro Project, where 14 missions were established and, and, and staffed, and churches began to grow there. You read down through the list of those accomplishments and the Heaven Airs Quartet. And I don't know if this is true. Some of you can tell me that some of these guys worked on the edge a little bit. But did they not own a hearse with Heaven Airs on the side? <laughs> Is that true, or am I, did I have a bad dream last night? I mean, they would drive up to church. I said, why would you do that? And they would say, we're here to take out the dead church members. I mean, that would get your attention. 
but he was known for being a little bit uh, creative in his work and and his singing and, and his guitar playing. And how many of you remember him playing a guitar with a harmonica strapped up here and, and singing and he tried to sing Sweet Evelina? How many ever learned to sing the song, I'm being swallowed by a... Need I say more? You know the one where it swallows your toe and then it works its way up and it gets to your neck and then the next thing is you're gone and the next thing, with respectful dignity, uh, this belch. And you're gone. Uh, well, why would he do that? Well, I know that was part of his way of creating a bridge and winning and warming up to people because he had another, another agenda in mind. That's to know people. Know where they were, know how they're hurting, know what they needed as far as a relationship with the Lord. Right, Tim? You inherited part of that. And Julie, you sing like your mom. And Dennis? Got a mind like your dad. Brother Bob married to Kay, <coughs> Dietta Cahill in 1954, preceded him in death in 1994. Also preceded in death by two brothers, Harley and Glenn Warren. And then married Gay, uh, Carolyn Anderson in Webb City, and she is here grieving the loss and celebrating at the same time. And we are privileged to be here. I have letters. Carolyn gave me from Dr. Jack Johnson, from Monty, Dr. Monty Martin, others from Malaysia have written in. Words on Facebook have gone out about the passing of this man because he touched a lot of lives. We are known by our family and our friends as we've just seen. And he has friends from all walks of life. The up, the down and out, those that have accomplished things by this world's standards Bob was not a respecter of people. He just knew people and he loved them. But you know, really the heart of what I want to say is right in through here. We are known by our failures and our struggles. When you saw Bob, he was pretty much always upbeat and, and excited about and a passion for what he was doing. And filtered through those long lists of accomplishment, you know Brother Bob by some of the struggles and failures he had to deal with. And they were there. Oh, he loved to see people come to receive Christ. That was, that was his passion. He loved to see lives change and nurture them and to help them experience and work through failures and, and some difficulties of life. But Brother Bob could identify with people where they were hurting the most. Most of you know, many of you, some of you may not, that those two brothers, Glenn and um, um, Harley, whose lives were taken in a tragic car accident when they were young, young men. They were coming home from a youth service. And as a 14-year-old boy, about 14 years old, Brother Bob had to deal with that as a understanding the loss of two brothers. I don't know what that would be like. I've been blessed to have two brothers, and they're still alive. But to suffer the loss at that young age, I don't know how he would deal with that. How would, that could turn someone really away from church and serving God because it happened when they were coming from church. But it didn't. And then to deal with his parents, the aftermath of that death and how it affected their lives. And Bob was faithful to take care of his parents. And Dieta, almost 40 years of marriage, but the last five were hard. And we can't even begin to know how hard. But before the Lord called her home, she suffered for five long years requiring 24-hour care. And Bob would not let that go. He cared for her, and he loved her, and he honored your mom. To me, that's a great thing and a great memory for Brother Bob. And I love, I, I mean, I was taken by what Julie said <clears throat> in talking about that incident with her mom. He said, talking to her dad in Arizona, he says, Dad, what keeps you from just walking away from faith, your faith? Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Put an asterisk by that. And if Julie forgets to tell you this, I did. Moving right along and quickly, we'll do that. I knew, I knew that this would not. That's okay. I'm used to it. No. 
Let me, let me go to a little lighter note, so to speak. We are known by our expressions of faith. Now, I, I, this is one that was fun to do. You could almost write Bob's obituary with song titles. And so, here we go, just a few. If you've got this one, Tim, anybody got this one? Okay. Just as I am, you, that would ring a bell. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm coming to Christ. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Something got a hold of me. I went there to fight, but I tell you that night, something got a hold of me. That's an old song. I was saved when I came to, I was going to, I was passing by a church, heard the singing, went in, life was changed. Amazing grace would have to over you, overcome you at that point. Amazing grace, how sweet, that saved a wretch like me. And the last verse says, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've only just begun. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Because people need the Lord. They need to know that holy, holy is what the angels sing. And they can't talk about redemption story, but we can. And even though life has struggles, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus and as we are stepping in the light, we'll understand it better by and by. And in the meantime, it is well with my soul. And there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. And he keeps me singing along the way. But what a day that will be. He was just singing that. But until then, my heart will go on singing. I'll carry on until the day God calls me home. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian and blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And I'm looking for a city and triumphantly one of these days the church will rise. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. So many things. So many memories. I asked some of you about words. A eulogy. Good words. And again, they came so fast and so many. And I'll, I'll try to move through these quickly. But Bob's good words were, I asked someone, well, how would you describe Bob? It didn't take long. Life, enthusiasm, and energy. He, had a, he lived with a passion. He, he loved sharing and teaching the word. He believed every, important, every person was, was valuable and as important and and worth, and he, it didn't matter. He, he would minister. He preached the same way with vigor, and he led, led by example. He had a compassionate heart about caring for, we mentioned Carolyn and their ministry together. But he, he had a compassion to see people and to honor people in their life. Now this one, I'm a little, I, I don't understand this, but, but it worked for Bob. And, but he, to express his love for his wife and the compassion that he had for her, Carolyn, he, he, I understand that he even, there was a custom made costume made for this man. And it came out of California. And Carolyn was telling me that there was a special a special faculty celebration for her birthday, a surprise party, and who would, who would believe that at her celebration, Elvis would show up? <laughs> I'd, he came in with a guitar. I would be suspicious right there, but she said, I did not know this guy. He was so dressed up, and he was, came in, and he's singing. What was he singing? Do you remember, Carolyn? Well, I, I, you're probably in shock. I mean, Elvis is back in the building. I mean, what are you going to do? But, he, but he, he would do things like that, and he would come and love me tender, love me true. I don't know what he would do, but it would be something. But can you imagine him doing things like this? Oh, yes, you can. But it was because he loved people, and he loved his wife and his family. He just sent you roses. They're still blooming. But people in crisis, some of us, of us have been there. It's Brother Bob, I know you're hurting. <clears throat> you have a need here, and I'm here. And he would be there out of compassion. He wanted to pray with you, and he would no matter what hour of the day. The story was told by two young men. They called Brother Bob late in the night and said, we have some friends, that a friend that's in the hospital had a problem. They're there. 
Would you just pray for them? Okay. They go to the hospital. They walk in the room. There's Brother Bob, dressed in his suit, and turned and asked him, where have you guys been? I mean, he beat them to the hospital, not just, that's, that's how he would work. Bob was generous. I mean, he, if, you, if he thought you had a need, you would have it. His life ministry that they developed to minister to others and giving Bibles away, giving books away, helping in any way anonymously to this day, and some will never know until eternity how Bob sought to honor and to be generous toward them. He had a passion. Evangelism was another word that came. <laughs> I, I don't know if I should tell this. One more. Brother Bob, <clears throat> and I'm, this is not, if there's any Web City Police Department or Joplin, this, we're not advocating speeding here. But I understand he was pulled over on Prairie Flower Road a couple of times. <laughs> and the second time they got him, they pulled him over, he asked this officer. He said, how am I going to win Web City to Christ going 35 miles an hour? <laughs> it kind of, he's a fisher of men. I mean, and he had a passion to fish, did he not? I remember on Sugar Creek one day, he came walking back to the cabin. I don't know if Jim remembers this or not, but he came by himself. He forgot to take a stringer. This is, this is not informal dignity. This is just, I don't know why. There was two fish tails hanging out of his pockets. He didn't have it. He just pop, poked them down in his pockets to carry him back to the cabin. But he had a greater passion for people and a greater desire to, to reach them. He was an encouraging, he was encur encouraging was his word. He was a Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Barnabas Bob. He was always encouraging. He was discerning. He had, an, he had an, 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 a gift of seeing beyond the obvious or showing up at the right time. You may have be in a crisis in a hospital or you may have a decision to make and I don't know how many times I'd see him walking across the parking lot on a particular day with a particular need that I had in my life or others had in their life. Integrity, as someone said, he was the same outside, he was the same at home as he was in this pulpit. He, there was a oneness about him. He was gifted, he was a gifted la leader, and a gifted leader has passionate followers. And by the men that have been raised up and the women that have gone into ministry, it is obvious that he mentored in a powerful way. He did have an informal dignity. Bob always wore a suit. That was his style. He wanted to look his best in his service. He loved, the love was another word for people. He had a redeeming, redeeming was something that he loved to see a life that had been shattered or broken, put back together and reestablished and repositioned and move on forward to better things. Well, you know, Mr. Elvis has left the building but Brother Bob has left this earth, and he's at home that he sung about, prayed about, taught us about, and he's enjoying the wonders of heaven today. And what a legacy we have. We are celebrating triumphant faith today, and we need to follow that. A sinner saved by grace that is fully alive and has left us a challenge to follow him. Dennis is going to come in just a moment. And you're going to spray. Reiterate what was said uh, as the first son, uh, I lived in the house with. Uh, dad and uh, I heard him every single Sunday and every Wednesday night and every other time the doors were open that mom and dad would uh, pull me to church as, and that's what happens with us preachers kids so I knew what he said from the pulpit <laughs> and I will attest to the fact that he lived this exact same way at home he really did and uh, you know uh, 
Jack said something about all the things that he accomplished are in that obituary. It was, I don't know if he said it quite that way, but certainly not all of the things. Uh, some of the most important things were just, you know, trying to work on the car. My dad was not a mechanic. <laughs> And uh, some of you, even who are mechanics, know that sometimes you scrape your knuckles all up and it's just frustrating. But uh, I'm telling you, just even the way Dad, I mean, there's just nothing that really rankled him so far as to push him uh, past the point where he wouldn't be consistent with what he taught. So it's, uh, it's his, uh, it's just a joy about Dad uh, that um, inspired me, you know. I study apologetics, uh, I, I try to learn all the good reasons, and there are many good reasons to be a Christian, you know, to believe that God exists and that Jesus Christ came to this earth, and, and God came in the person of Jesus and gave himself for us. There's a lot of good rational reasons, but probably the biggest reason why I decided to be a Christian and stay a Christian, uh, I don't know if it's the biggest, but it's a biggest, a big one, is the joy that I saw in my dad. And uh, I thought, good grief, being a Christian can make you that happy, you know. <laughs> even when you scrape your knuckles or even when you deal with, you know, the tough things with people, you know, like the, the illness that my mom had for so long. I said, man, if being a Christ Christian can help you to live like that, I want it. So, anyway, I'll try to sing this without <clears throat> getting too teary-eyed here. Um, when uh, Julie called and said that Dad had passed away in the night, um, there was just, I don't know, half hour, an hour after that, going through my mind was a clear, I could just hear my father singing, you know, one of the songs that he sang about getting to heaven. And it was, I was you know, it's almost more than a memory. It was almost like a recording. I don't know if, this is, if it was Sony or what, <laughs> what it was up here. but So I don't know, after that I thought, well, maybe if it does that much good for me to remember this, uh, it'll help the folks at the funeral. So I want to sing some of these things that I heard Dad sing. Um, and remember that, you know, he's singing in a different way now. Um, it was that he was this side of, of a, 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 this side of eternity. You know, he was still in the mortal realm when he sang. But now he's, he's on the other side of eternity. And so it gives me courage to sing these songs still now with a little different meaning. it all when we see Jesus life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ one glance of his dear face all sorrow will erase so bravely run the race till we see Christ. Dad's work on earth is done, earth storms for him have passed. He's crossed the great divide to glory safe at last. He shares the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. For him the tempter's banished, he has laid his burdens down. It will be worth it all when I see Jesus. Since he sees Christ, oh, I'll bravely run the race. Yes, cause I will see his face. I'll bravely run that race till I see Christ. We will bravely run. Till we see Christ. Amen. 
Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives All fear is gone Because I know I know he holds the future Life is worth the living just because he lives just the other day dad crossed that river he fought life's final war with pain and as his death gave way to victory he sees the lights of glory and i know he lives because they live i can face Just because God lives Our lives are worth our living Just because God that um well i stopped jack <laughs> sorry about that uh, and oh i just have to take a minute to look at it all of you for just a second wow thank you so much for coming i see so many faces that dad loved good grief nearly all all of you not nearly <laughs> wow um Okay, let's see here. Um, when I was asked to say something, and I thought, oh no, can't do that. And I thought, oh, I'll regret not saying something. So I thought, yeah, I have to say something, but how do you put into a few minutes a lifetime of memories that surpass anything that words can say? And I know each of you, and I see lots of memories just looking out at you, that you all have a memory to share, just like I do. Um, so I thought, okay, which, what am I going to say? And I thought, oh, I'm going to share the most important memory I have of my dad. Um, and so uh, the one that I'm going to share, if I can, is the defining moment in my life because he's the one that uh, was there at the defining moment in my life and it's been about 20 years ago now and I've been a Christian for about 40 years now and so I had served the Lord for about 20 years at that time that this happened and um, but looking back on it I had served my father's God for about 20 years. I loved my father's God, but he wasn't my God yet. And um, so at this point in time, I can remember it well. Uh, we were sitting in the living room of his house. And I know you've all had one-on-one -on -one conversations with dad, and boy, he those eyes just pierce right through you. And um, with lots of love always. And uh, 
We were in the middle of my mom's suffering at this point, and it had probably reached an all-time low, I guess I would say, or maybe high. But the suffering was great at that point, and it was great on us as well. And life was very hard then. And um, since I was serving my father's God instead of my God, I was questioning big time. How on earth can we be serving a God who would let this suffering take place in our lives as well as hers? And so this afternoon that I'm talking about, we were sitting there and pain was just all over him. And I looked at him and I said, Dad, I said, aren't you just tempted to turn away from God and just walk away and leave this faith behind? And he looked at me straight in the eye. And I'll never forget what he said because it was the defining moment in my life. And he said, Julie, he said, where else would I turn? He alone has the words of life. And I think I just sat there stunned for just a minute, and he said, do you know I'll serve him if he slays me? And I know I just sat there for a long time. He gave me lots to think about. And I said, I want to know this God. I want to know him for me. I don't want to serve your God anymore. I want to serve my God. And if you love him that much, that you watched your brothers die and you still loved him and you watched mom suffer and suffer and suffer and you still loved him and you still knew he was real he has to be real and I'm going to find him and that was 20 years ago and do you know the Bible says if you will seek him with your whole heart you will find him and I found him, and now he's my God. He's not just my father's God. And we lay my father to rest today. His body, his old worn out earth suit that he's cast aside. But I just, I share that memory with you in hopes that if you're serving your father's God, or if you're serving your grandfather's God, or any other thing but your God, that you will seek him with your whole heart while he may be found. Because the Bible said he won't always strive with man. We may not have long left. My dad believed with his whole heart that Christ is coming soon, and I believe it. And I just want you to know, if your life, in your life, if you don't have your God, then find him. And I can tell you this, if I was still serving my father's God, when I laid my father to rest today, that love for that God would die with him. But it isn't. He's my God, and I'm going to serve him if he's lay me. So thank you for, for loving him and for being here today, and you mean the world to us because of your love for him. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for great words. And thank you all for being here today, for being a part of this celebration, a homegoing. There were two things that Bob preached on more than probably anything else, and all of us, all of you could tell me what those are. Heaven and the second coming. He was looking forward to seeing Christ. The Bible says, and I saw, and by the way, this takes on a whole new meaning today for me. I know it will for you. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heavens and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. 
Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the mountains of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I praise God that today he's found Jesus, continues to be his son. One of his favorite songs that I'm going to try to sing today. I you to listen to the words. Of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet. At the midnight cry We'll be going home When Jesus steps out On a cloud to call his children The dead in Christ shall Prophecies fulfilling And the signs of the times They're appearing everywhere I can almost hear the Father children was at the midnight cry the bride of Christ we're gonna rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air and then those that Right. When 
Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'm the middle child, Tim, and uh, I'll tell you, Dad used to, oh, after a, a day of the manual, he'd come home, I'd call him, he called me, he'd said, you should have heard it, Richard sang in the bed. <laughs> you should have, you should have been there. I'm there. I tell you, look, Dad is there. He's sung about heaven. He's preached about heaven. He's talked about heaven. He loved Jesus with all of his heart, and he couldn't wait to get to heaven. He's there. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm wearing cufflinks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wrote a few things down. I want to make sure I know what I want to say. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, We sorrow, but we don't sorrow as those with no hope. See, there's a difference for Christians and non-Christians. You know it. That is, we know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Oh, I look around, so many that love Dad, so many that He loved you. It was a great part in your life. And every every single one he touched, he made them feel, and I shared with Julie, he made them feel special. Every single person, he made them feel special. And Jack brought that out, and that's, that's true. He did. And he also made me feel special. And growing up, as he was pastor, I could come into his office at any time. Nobody else could do that. I'd get past secretary. I'd go right into his office. Hey, no problem there. He, he didn't put me down uh, for it. You know, he had to introduce me. And he did introduce me all over the place. So uh, he had a zest for life. He used to say vim, vigor, and vitality. And he had a zest for life. He just had it. Uh, and I think the reason he prospered in every pastorate that he had, and in the Southern Baptist Convention, in so many different positions, is because he loved people, and he loved Jesus with all of his heart. And it just he just prospered in everything he did. God just blessed him. Uh, very important. All I know about personal evangelism sharing Christ with someone and see them come to know the Lord, I learned from my dad. I mean, I've been to evangelism conferences galore, and I know many of you have as well. And uh, he's been to more. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of folks baptized, been able to baptize folks. He baptized more. Uh, all of those things... I pastored a church with 220 in Sunday school. That was great for me, but he did more. I baptized, I, I had a church with 15 in Sunday school. He had less. <laughs> <laughs> but he grew it. I mean, it just prospered because, you know, uh, all of these things, you know. Dad sang, and when he sang, he sang with a heart full of joy. I mean, every single one of us, we got that from him. We sing with joy because we love the Lord with all of our heart. And we watch Dad sing. Growing up, growing up, I listened to the Maranatha Trio. Fred Durge, Henry Smart, Bob Warren sang the Maranatha Trio. Then they had the heaven there. I'd listen to them in the home. Mom said, you need to go to sleep. They'd be singing until 2 in the morning in the lift. How are you going to go to sleep with them singing? And uh, that was Dick Deringer, and that was uh, uh, Gordon Watson, and uh, that was uh, uh, Henry Smart and Dad. Heaven there all the way through. Henry Smart, uh, I'm not going to dwell on lots of things. They've been said. Jack, you did a fantastic job. I mean, you nailed it. Because he's been close to you. You've been close to him. Dawson family, so close. I mean, I look around too like Julie. My goodness. So many that have been so close to him. All of his life. 
uh, Henry Smart from junior high. Uh, no, no, been with Dad the whole time. Matter of fact, I got to tell you something he used to tell me. They used to sing, play guitar, and, and sing on the radio. And that was James Smart, Henry Smart, uh, two, two brothers and Dad. And the uh, announcer said, he announced the two smart brothers and Bob Warren. <laughs> Maybe the song that started it all. Uh, Henry uh, and Dad uh, used to sing as they began. I'm, I'm going to do the best I can with it. Our names are Bobby and Henry. We're from WHS Windsor High School. We're here to entertain you and we'll try to do our best. We hope you laugh at all our jokes and none of them fall flat. And if you don't get them, we ain't to blame for that. <laughs> ain't we crazy, ain't we crazy? And we're gonna sing a crazy song. Ain't we crazy, ain't we crazy? And we're gonna sing a crazy tune. Ain't we crazy? Ain't we crazy? We're just as crazy as a loon. <laughs> Maybe that started it all, I don't know. But uh, Henry Smart, come and share with us uh, just a few words if you would. A few words from junior high all the way through the heaven airs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wearing two hats this, uh, this morning. The Arizona Convention of Southern Baptists asked me to come and share their sympathies and their prayers with the family and you, Carolyn. So Bob spent so many great times there and did so many beautiful things, so they wanted me to share that with you. Bob was not saved in a church, church house. He was not saved in a home. He was saved out in a oat field by a shock of oats or shock of wheat. He asked Christ to come into his life there in that field. As I mentioned, or as uh, Tim mentioned, I got to know Bob when I was in a junior high. We started playing guitars together, had a great time. I remember going out to his house. He invited me over to spend the night. And Mrs. Warren baked a chocolate cake. And she didn't have icing on the cake. She had that thick cream that comes when you separate the milk and the cream. Bob and I would eat that and enjoy it so much. We would write a song. You've never heard this song. By the way, my title of what I'm, going, what I'm saying is the rest of the story, <laughs> or what you don't put in an obituary. <laughs> we wrote a song called, Although You Are a Thousand Miles Apart. His girl and my girl were gone about a thousand miles away, so here's where it goes. Although you are a thousand miles apart, I'm sitting here pining out my heart. You say you're lonely, but what do you think of me? There's no one here just like you to keep me company. I'm so sad and blue. Tell me what can I do? When I'm all alone, it breaks my heart because you are a thousand miles apart. Ever heard that song before? <laughs> and we wrote another one. It goes something like this. Well, why don't you love me just a little bit more? Your love is falling off, it seems. Just some little way to show me you care would bring back your... F oh, you're a preacher, aren't you? <laughs> Has this ever been sung in this church? In my dreams. 
Well, why don't you love me just a little bit more? Then life would be so neat. Just a little kiss from you, and that would be my cue with some love, and that would make life complete. Just when I thought I had you, you drifted off my line. So, darling, won't you love me more? Are you break this heart of mine? Well, why don't you love me just a little bit more? Then life would be so neat. Just a little kiss. Kiss from you, and that would be my cue with some love, and that would make life complete. That's <laughs> well, we wrote those songs. We had a great time. We thought we were so good. We heard that KMBC in Kansas City, Missouri, was auditioning, and so Bob and I took our guitars and we went up there to audition. Now the men came out and said, "Now when you." When you finish, we'll not show any emotion whatsoever. You know, just sing your song, and we'll just be somber and so on. So we sang our song, and do you know what it was? Seager eats whiskey and wild, wild women. <laughs> That's your Bob. That's your Bob. <laughs> and you know, we came out of that studio, and they were laughing their heads off. I owe Bob, in a way, for my first kiss, because. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. His girlfriend gave me my first kiss. You don't put that in the obituary. We went to Southwest Baptist College. Bob did a great thing for me. He told my girlfriend at the time, which I, I guess I, I knew she wasn't correct, right, really, really right for me, but uh, I, I was loyal. I, I have that trait. I, I hang in there and I'm loyal. <laughs> but he said to her, you know, you ought to date other boys. <laughs> and because Bob did that, that freed me up to marry this lady over there. <laughs> So I owe Bob a lot. You mentioned the Maranatha Trio. This came really late in life, but man, uh, Tim, that was a great experience, the Maranatha Trio. But I think we ought to rename the Maranatha Trio to the Maranatha Political Trio because Bob was pastor of Red Bridge. I was pastor in a church at White Settlement and Fred Durge was pastoring Little Blue. <laughs> Isn't that great? One of these days, we're going to stand before God, and we're going to get our rewards. Jesus is going to give our rewards. And I, th I was thinking of Bob, and I said to myself, you know, Bob is going to receive at least two that I know of. Maybe more, I'm sure more rewards. But two at least, one is he's a soul winner. One of the greatest soul winners I have ever known. Amen. Wouldn't you agree, Hubert? Amen. Wouldn't you agree, uh, Dick? A great soul winner. So you're gonna, uh, he's going to receive that crown, that soul winner's crown. And then he'll receive this, I, I think, the Barnabas crown. The encourager, the mentor, the one who surrounds himself with young men who will go out and win people to Christ and become great ministers in the Lord. You don't hear this always, but that's the rest of the story. Thank you. Wow, that's been some great sharing and I uh, appreciate that very much. The family, you've done a wonderful job uh, remembering your dad. Henry, thank you. Jack, thank you, it's great. The family wanted me to take just a few moments to recognize some, a few different people. And the first they wanted me to recognize was the Heaven Heirs. If you sang with Bob and the Heaven Heirs, would you stand here this morning? There we go. Right here. Good. You can be seated. The other group was the, the Windsor High School Class 1951. If any of you were in his high school class, would you stand? Anyone here from Windsor Class? Okay. Very good. 
The, se- the third group, if you received a Bible from Brother Bob at any point, would you stand just if you received a Bible from Brother Bob? Well, wow, that's great. Thank you. You may be seated. That's tremendous. Uh, the other one, uh, there's two more. If, you, if Brother Bob was instrumental in leading you to Christ, would you stand if Brother Bob led you to Christ? Amen. Wow, that's great. That's great. All right, you can be seated. Thank you. And the last one is uh, if you were mentored by Brother Bob, if you was one of Brother Bob's uh, mentees, would you stand for that as well? Preacher boys. Was you a preacher boy? Very good. Look at this. This is great. You can be seated. Since uh, Brother Bob was so instrumental in a lot of young men's life, including my own, by God's grace, uh, they wanted one of those guys to speak this morning, just just briefly. And so, Brother Nathan, would you come and share with us? It is quite an honor to be able to to do this. The last time I was asked to, to do anything on a time limit, I put a mint in my mouth So when it was gone, I would sit down. But when I reached my pocket, I got a button instead, and I just kept on going and going. So today, I put a watch in my back pocket so I would sit down on time. And if you don't get those jokes, you'll get them later because they're timed. So it was a privilege and an honor to be um, able to be under Bob. I remember the day in my life when I really felt like the door was closing on a ministry and that same week, I got a call from Bob and said, hey, we're looking for a youth guy. And I thought, awesome. You know, who, who, who me? You know, kind of a deal. But, you know, it worked out that he would be instrumental in calling me to manual. And what a great three years we had here. You know, it was quite a deal to, to be under Bob because he not only taught you, you know, about ministry, but also other things about, you know, things like visitation. And uh, when the secretary would call, just make sure he had a boat named Visitation. And so she could say, well, I'm out on Visitation. And uh, we bought him a boat, and we hauled it down the aisle, and we named it Visitation. And uh, so we'd call, and he'd be out there on Visitation. So, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the spring, if you couldn't catch any fish, it would make sense because they were in school all summer. So, but he also instructed you on how to, uh, you know, there's a pre-release, you know, when a fish would get a hook, and, and he jumped the boat, you know, at the boat. And there's a pre-pre-release when you just get a nibble. You know, but no matter they still count, ministerially speaking, they all counted as catches, <laughs> just pre-release and, <laughs> and pre-pre-release. He also spent some time with me trying to help me get to sing. Remember that morning when he came in, he goes, I don't, you don't make any sense to me. He says, you're the only guy that can play the guitar, can hear when something is out of tune, and yet can't sing. He goes, we're going to fix that. So we came over here to the piano, and we sat down for about a minute and a half, and he said, he said, well, that's enough for today. We'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow never came. So. <laughs> I want to share with you just briefly a verse of scripture that came to mind this week when I heard the news, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And, uh, and as I read this, I'm just going to share a few thoughts. But the first thing he would say is that all of us are preachers with little peas. You know, all of us are, are encouraged to preach the word. But some of us in here are preachers with a big P, with a capital P, in terms of those who are called into the ministry. And uh, so this is, I think, to all of us, really, Because in this passage, we see where Timothy is really being passed the baton. You know, Paul is recognizing that his life is almost over, and he's passing the baton and saying, okay, keep on going. And here's some significant instructions for us as those that have been touched by his life. Paul says, I'm just going to read a few verses, and I'll share a few things, and then I will make sure I sit down on time. Um, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. When I read that, I thought, okay, here is someone speaking on behalf of God. And if you're going to speak on behalf of God, you better look good, right? If you're an ambassador for the king, you better look the part, right? And uh, so he would always have his suit on and, uh, and challenges to look good. And I'm reminded of the same story of the, the two gentlemen that called Brother Bob and said, hey, we have a situation at the hospital. Would you come and pray? And uh, he said, they beat us there, and he's in a suit. And I said, he's kind of like Superman. He just would, you know, rip off, you know. <laughs> There's his suit, ready to go. But he looked apart, and he would talk about, on behalf of the king, I'm going to preach on behalf of the king, and he would, he, would, he would share. But 
He says, who is a judge of the, of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Richard mentioned the two things, or Tim mentioned the two things, his appearing, second coming, and heaven. And here he is given a charge, you know, saying on behalf of God and upon Jesus, the, who is the judge, and on his appearing, and on, on his kingdom. So we see four things here he's, he's on behalf of. Then, of course, he says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. You know, I was thinking about preaching the word. He would say something like, you know, out of all the options out there, out of all the Bibles you can buy, you know, make sure you get one that's read and studied and memorized. And he would say something to us that says, you know, when a preacher comes and, and says something like, what should I preach today? What should I preach? He says, it's like a kid going to the ocean saying, where can I find a bale of water? Where can I find a pail of water? You know, because if you're in the word, there's always something to preach and always a message. And Paul would say, preach the word. He said, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. And, of course, we know about exhortation, reprove and rebuke. I remember something I've used several times when people would ask me about, you know, can a Christian do that? And I said, you know, if you fail at your faith, your faith is faulty from the first. That's a wisdom, that's something from Brother Bob that's, that has really gave me some insight in, the, in, the, in recent days, actually. Reprove and rebuke and exhort. And we know that he would give exhort. When I was reading today and... And thinking about these words, exhort means this, give hope to the faint-hearted by providing tender encouragement in the face of discouraging opposition. And that's Bob. I remember him saying, some pastors get their message by spending hours and hours and hours behind a desk. I get my messages when I'm out among the people. And I've never forgot that, about the importance that he had about being out and about among the people. And of course, with patience and instruction, Paul says. He says, for a time will come, and we're there, folks, aren't we? For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have themsel themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their eyes from the truth, their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And as at all things that I think about above, I think about the soul winning. You know, he would encourage us to keep our mind ready and to endure hardships and do the work of the, of the evangelist. You know, as I would, in, at Emmanuel and I would preach, and we, Monday morning we'd evaluate, you know, the kind of the, you know, the game film type thing and, uh, in, the, in the office, and he would say, you know, you did good. And he would say, let me, let me encourage you, let your words protrude out into the audience. You know, he would say, slow down, he would say, I'm still working on that. But he would also say, you know, your message is good. But you need to prepare your invitation. You prepare and you know, spend time preparing your invitation. He says you, you prepare your message expecting people to come forward. You preach your message expecting people to come forward. And you give the invitation expecting people to come forward down the, down the aisle. And I'll never just, I just, I wish I had that gift to, to give an invitation like Brother Bob could give. And, uh, and I sit in, the, in, the, in a pew, listen to a preacher, and I'm going, that was a terrible invitation. <laughs> what did he say? You know, and, uh, and I still hear, you know, Brother Bob saying, you know, Give that invitation, prepare that invitation but more than anything because that's what you're expecting people to come is to respond to your call. And lastly, fulfill your ministry. He has done that. And I would encourage those in here that have surrendered under the ministry and been mentored by Bob to fulfill your ministry. Keep on keeping on just as Bob did all the way to the end. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. I will be forever grateful for having known Brother Bob. Uh, he was a prince of a man, and standing here sharing the word of the Lord in celebration of his home going is uh, quite an honor and a real privilege of mine. I'm grateful for the time that Brother Bob took uh, uh, to, to get to know me. Uh, I'm grateful for the relationship that we was able to develop in the short time that I've been here as pastor. Brother Bob, I, I realized, took to me very quickly, and uh, I, I don't think it was just me that he took to very quickly. He did that to a lot of guys and uh, a lot of people, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I'm blessed to have been able to, uh, to get to know him, and I'm extremely blessed to be able to serve as a pastor of the church that he, quote-unquote, interim served as pastor for 13-plus <laughs> years. <laughs> he laid a wonderful foundation of ministry here at Emmanuel Baptist Church and left an indelible mark on the men of this church. And it is somewhat like, somewhat like Moses and a Joshua sort of scenario. Brother Bob served faithfully to lead many out of the slavery of sin to come to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, in some ways, I have the baton and, as you can see, have some really, really big shoes to fill as pastor here at Emmanuel. Um, 
The church is gracious, I should say. Amen. Brother Bob left a legacy, and it's not hard to tell the legacy that was left. That's what we've been sharing today is a legacy. We're going to remember that legacy. And I want to share with you just a little bit about legacy this morning out of the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, 7, and 8. It says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, Paul said, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We should all live our lives completely devoted to the cause of Christ. If we're going to leave a legacy, we all, each one of us say, well, I, I'm not a preacher. I can't do that. Well, I don't care if you're a preacher or not. You, you may be a plumber. You may be a principal. You may be a, a stay-at-home mother. But we all should live our lives completely devoted to the cause of Christ if we're going to leave a legacy in this life. We should live our lives poured out. You know, when Brother Bob played in the 1950 state basketball tournament, I can only imagine what kind of competitor he was. Uh, if he was half the competitor he was as a minister, he was a fierce competitor on the basketball court. And I'm quite certain that when he left the court that night in that state uh, basketball tournament, I, 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 I don't think he probably thought this. I, I, I doubt this thought was going through his head. Boy, I wish I would have went just a little harder tonight. I, I don't think Bob would have said that when he left the court. I, I'm quite certain that when he left the court, he left that court that night saying, I gave it my best. You see, friends, th there's no such thing and there's no time for one to say, boy, I wished I would have went, I, I wished I would not have went so hard. Anybody ever leave the basketball court or the football field and say, boy, I wished I would have went just, I, I wished I wouldn't have went so hard. There's no such thing as that. You see, friends, we need to live our lives poured out for, and completely devoted to Christ. You see, Paul was about to be offered up, even to the point of shedding his blood for the cause of Christ in 2 Timothy chapter 4. You see, friends, he had offered his life up for the sake of someone else. And Brother Bob did the same. He offered up his life for the sake and the cause of the gospel and for the cause of someone else. He was dedicated to the redemptive work of the cross. We should all live our lives with this sense of complete devotion. You see, friends, our departure is certain. And there is coming a day when our lives on this earth will come to an end and there will be no redos. There's no such thing as coming back and saying, boy, I wish I could do this over again. Paul said, my time has come. My, I, I've been poured out as a drink offering and my departure is, is at hand. And when I depart and leave this earth, there's no redos. And I, I, I beg you, listen, church, uh, folks, there's no redos. You can't do this life over again. And if you're going to leave a legacy now, the kind of legacy that lives on, the kind of legacy that challenges me as I stand uh, here before you this morning, I beg you, be devoted to the cause of Christ. A mother, father, teacher, firefighter, pastor, devoted to the cause of Christ. And realize that one day there's going to be no more opportunities for redos. The second thing, we should strive to live our lives with no regrets. And Paul lived his life, I believe, with no regrets in a lot of ways. He came to Christ. Brother Bob lived his life with no regrets. And there's some very clear instruction from the Word of God that it shares with us and teaches us and instructs us how we should live a life with no regrets. The first thing is this. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I have fought a good fight. Not a good fight, but the good fight. And Brother Bob fought the good fight. Uh, th this life, friends, we should be engaged in the battle for souls. And Brother Bob lived as a man engaged in the battle for souls and he shared the gospel I have not set passively by brother Bob didn't set passively by and I beg you fight the good fight there's a lot of fights to fight in this world but there's only one good fight and that's the fight of winning people to Jesus the Bible tells us that he gave some as evangelists and in so doing he saw fit to give us brother Bob Warren a bubbly individual full of wit faith and enough desire to whip a lion and he shared the gospel. He fought the good fight, engaged in the battle over the lost souls of this world. Bob and I are in our most recent conversation. We spent a bit of time on Monday morning together, about an hour, and he taught me how you get somebody out of your office that stays too long. I appreciate that <laughs> bit of information. <laughs> It's the last thing he told me. And by the way, since uh, I'm getting ready to leave, let me pray for you, he said. And he prayed for me, and that was it. 
I had another question I wanted to talk to him about, but uh, I thought if we'd already spent about an hour, I'll set up another point. We'll go over that another time, and I wished I would have got that in. But anyway, we, we lamented the fact that we, we are living in a day when perhaps folks don't think old-fashioned evangelism still works, but Bob says, I still think it works. I still know it works. We still just need to preach Jesus and share the gospel to people, and we, that's all we need to do when people come to Christ. And I said, I, I, I agree with you, Brother Bob. So I have fought the good fight, Paul says, and if you're going to live with no regrets, you've got to be engaged in a battle, fighting the good fight. The second thing, Paul says, I finished the course. You see, this life, friends, is a race. It is not to the swift. It is, it is to the persevering, however, to those who persevere, and Brother Bob persevered through many, many trials. Bob finished his course. Paul says, I've kept the faith. One who keeps the faith understands the value of what they hold. They are in no way going to deny the Savior. And as Julie shared, friends, there came a time when this was a very difficult thing in Brother Bob's life. And through that very most difficult and trying time, through the illness of his wife, he remained faithful. He kept the faith. And friends, if we're going to leave a lace, we fight the good fight. And, and friends, we keep the faith and finish the race. The last thing, friends, if we should live, if we're going to leave a legacy, we should live our lives motivated by future reward. Paul says that there's an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs this present suffering. And Paul lived for this future reward. There's a crown that awaits those who, are, who have offered themselves up in the service of the king. Brother Bob enjoy, is enjoys his reward now. Friends and family, when, when this fine Christian man left this earthly body, he was ushered into the presence of the Lord. He is in the presence of the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold, golden lampstands. He is in the presence of the one who is, a, who is the first and the last, who was dead and has come to life. He is in the presence of the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. He is in the presence of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. He is in the presence of the one who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He is in the presence of the one uh, who is is holy, who is true, and who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. He is in the presence of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. He is in the presence of the one who makes all things new. He is in the presence of the one whom his, whom his soul loved. He is in the presence of the spotless Lamb of God who rose from the dead, conquering death and hell. There in his presence he has joined the saints who have gone before. There in his presence his knee is bent and his head is bowed before the Lamb of God. In his presence his faith has come to in his presence he has received and understands fully the wonderful riches of, an, of his inheritance. There in his presence he has been shown the place that the Lord has prepared for him. For the Lord says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions and many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, and this is the greatest reward we could ever have in heaven, that where I am, there you may also be. Just just getting to be with Christ is the greatest reward we'll ever have. There, friends, in his presence, before his throne, he has joined the multitude, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Perhaps he is proclaiming the trisagion of the seraphim, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Friends and family, we mourn, but sure to not like those who have no hope. Our mourning in grieving is different. We have hope. We have hope because Jesus lives and he's coming back. Listen, friends, and turn your ear to heaven. Listen. Do you hear the voice? Do you hear the trumpet? The voice of the archangel and the trumpet sound. And at last, the Lord Jesus will descend from heaven and we will be together with our loved ones again. With the Lord. Let me ask you, are you ready for Christ's return? Are you ready? Brother Bob left a wonderful testimony of faithfulness. He left us a testimony of life that was surrendered completely to the Lord Jesus. And I ask you and beg with, beg with you, consider the life that you are living and what kind of legacy you are leaving behind. In this church this morning sits mothers and fathers, grandpas and grandmas, and children and youth. Consider the kind of life you're living and the kind of ramifications your life has on those around you. This man knew what kind of ramifications his life would have on others around him, and he lived it to the fullest. Are you leaving a lasting legacy of faithfulness and service to our Lord? 
How do you completely surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ? Brother Bob had a relationship with Christ. And because of that relationship, today we celebrate his home going. What about you? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Do you have a relationship with Christ? Perhaps you're here this morning. You do not, you do not know if you, where you would go when you, when you die. The thing about a funeral brings us face to face with the reality and the inevitability of our, of our own death. And when your life comes to an end on this earth, will you, will you, and will the people around you know without a doubt that you're spending eternity in heaven? Will they know that? Have you told anybody? Do you have a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that is evident that you're living it out? You see, friends, this, the Bible tells us this life is very uncertain and it's very short. It's like a vapor, the Bible says. You say, well, I've got a lot of years left. I'm young. You, you don't have that much time. You say, well, I, I'm old and I put this off and so I'm going to keep putting it off. You, you don't have that much time either. You're just a vapor. And I believe that Brother Bob's greatest desire would be for his life to challenge each one of us to leave a legacy. And his life and his subsequent death would challenge us to ponder our own eternity. I've got to ask you, are you born again? The Bible says unless you're born again, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you die, will you bust the gates of hell wide open? Or will you hear these words, welcome home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Or will you hear the words that will be said, depart from me, I never knew you. You may be asking, how can I be saved? This is a good question. The Bible says that we must be born again. You have to understand that you've sinned and then you need to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus. It is very simple how this works. Jesus said the Holy Spirit of God would come and he would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Friends, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's, it's evident in who we are. We have sinned. We are sinners. And the Spirit of God may be this morning convicting you of your sin. You may be realizing, I'm, I've sinned. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that death is eternal separation from God. You know what sin does? Sin separates us from God. In such, in such a way that if you was to die with that sin in your life that's separating you from God, you'd be eternally separated from God. The Bible says that while we were still sinners in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us and that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus paid the price for our sins so that we could be forgiven Amen. and you could be saved and set free from the sin in your life and have a hope and assurance of your home in heaven. What do you need to do? Well, the Bible says you need to repent of your sins. You need to turn to Jesus. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to ask you, friends, this morning, would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? What will you do when death becomes a reality in your own mind? What will you do? The most regrettable thing that you could ever do is turn away from Christ. It will be a decision that you'll regret for an eternity to know that Christ is real and yet to be so hard-hearted and so nearsighted that you would not surrender your life to Christ. There was a rich man in Lazarus, and the rich man regretted as he looked up from the pit of hell, and he said, somebody go tell my family that they need to surrender their life to Jesus. Somebody go tell my family. He was in deep remorse and regret. With your head bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you, the friends, this morning, is there any of you here that need to give your life to Christ? Is there someone here this morning that would say to me with the heads bowed and eyes closed, you would just slip your hand up and say, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Just, just go ahead and slip your hand up. I'm going to pray for you. If there's any here that would need to give their life to Christ. Maybe there's some of you here that says, you know what? I want to leave a legacy. Maybe you've got that decision in your heart. Would you, would you slip your hand and say, I'm one of those people that want to leave a legacy. Would you raise your hand if you want to leave a legacy? I want to leave a legacy. God is good. And he's gracious to save. He's mighty to save. And I trust this morning that it is well with your soul and that each one of you are walking 
in a relationship, a vibrant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this family. I thank you, Father, for the strength that you've given them. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would bless them. I pray for each person here that you would comfort them. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you look this way, there's a little insert in your uh, memorial uh, that you received as you come through the door. Uh, if you perhaps in your own heart say, you know what, I didn't raise my hand, but I do need to make a decision for Christ, would you put your name on that and your phone number and I'll be calling you? The second thing the family asks you to do with that little, that little slip of paper that is inserted in that memorial, it looks like this. There's go We're getting ready to play a song to end the service this morning before we re uh, intern at the cemetery. And while that song's playing and while people are filing out here this morning, would you just write a memory down of, of Brother Bob? Maybe it's something that's on your heart. Maybe some way that Brother Bob has impacted your life, influenced your life. Maybe it's been a, cru a crucial point in your life when he's been there for you, prayed with you. Something uh, of a good memory that this family could hang on to. Would you just jot that down? And there's a basket that's right over here on this white pillar, just to the, my right, your left. And when you leave here, we'll be filing the folks this way. Would you just drop those particular notes in that basket for the family. They would appreciate if you would do that. The song that you're about to, to hear is a song of Brother Bob that he and uh, Carolyn did here just not long ago at Emmanuel. Uh, we had the Warren Family Night of Music. It was a great night here on a Sunday evening uh, that we had. And Brother Bob came up and sang a song. You'll hear this in just a minute. And uh, it's very interesting, the, the, back, the story behind the story here is that at some point here in the recent past, Brother Bob had lost his voice. He had a paralyzed vocal cord and couldn't sing very high, and he was a bit discouraged by this, a bit frustrated. And by God's grace, the Lord saw fit to heal Brother Bob's voice, and what you're about to hear is the result of God's mercy on his life. So if you would listen, then we'll dismiss for the service. So although I'm not an angel... Yet I know that over there I will join a blessed chorus That the angels cannot share I will sing about my Savior Who upon dark Calvary Freely pardoned my transgressions Died to set a sinner free. Holy, holy is what the angels sing, and I expect to help them make. The courts of heaven ring But when I sing redemption story They will fold their wings For angels never felt the joy